riding that have had to go through you know, incredible hoops just to get funding, funding significantly less than $60 million. You know, I think of things like the Canoe Volant, the, the, the Flying Canoe Festival, the, the biggest French festival in, my, in, in Edmonton. I think about the, the Edmonton Ski Club, the Richie Community League. None of them were able to access the funds that were able, that was able to be accessed in this case, the $60 million. And, and what they, what organizations across this country could do with that money is, is frankly, is frankly um, what I what I'm thinking of when I think about this waste. So I have I have a question, Ms. Hogan, for you. If you could just talk a little bit about, you know, what do I say to the the people in my riding, the organizations in my riding who are trying to get funding from this government, but see this this incredibly unfair process? And would you agree that it seems like a system like this is in fact very much stacked against them? <laughs> Well, the procurement system in the federal public service is is um, is complex. There are so many rules, and I agree. And and that that's at times the complexity of trying to um, compete to get a contract makes it difficult for smaller vendors. Which is why I d I am concerned that the reaction to uh, the findings around ArriveCan would be to layer on more controls or make it even slower. Um, and, and and that would discourage competition. And the whole point about um, having competitive contracts versus non-competitive contracts is to encourage competition to ensure that the public service gets the best value that they can for taxpayer money. Uh, so I, I'm just concerned that there might be a, a requirement that um, the rules get tighter or stricter or another layer on that will limit that competition. And I believe the Deputy Auditor General has said it before, and I've said it before in testimony in front of this committee, you know, the, the, the business of government needs to keep moving forward. The rules, however, need to be respected um, in, in order to ensure that that happens, and that just didn't happen in this case. Yeah, well, and, and from my perspective, too, I mean, adding more rules when the rules aren't being followed is 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 counterproductive, of course. Um, but also, I, I, I look at this issue of fairness. I look at the idea that for smaller organizations, it's almost impossible to, to meet the obligations of the federal government. I've worked in international development for most of my career. It's, it's almost impossible for small organizations to access funding, for example, through Global Affairs Canada. But, but, um, but the issue, like, is there a way that we could look at ensuring, like, how do we make sure that the people are following the rules and, and equally make sure that, that there is that issue of fairness? You know, that's extremely important that the people who are trying to get benefits or services from from um, the government and um, that have repeatedly faced barriers are able to access those services. You know, I, I think about veterans. I think about people living with disabilities, indigenous communities um, who are repeatedly told that, no, they're not able to. They need to resubmit forms. Uh, they need to go to court, all of these things. And yet we see this government hand out seemingly open ended contracts that that you know, the eventual winners helped to actually write. So, you know, do you, you, you talk about not wanting to add more barriers, Ms. Hogan. You talk about not wanting to make it harder. Um, but do you see any hope for everyday normal Canadians who are just trying to get services from this government? It seems like every day we're getting closer to a privatized government. I think I would point to some of the work that I, my office has previously done and one on access um, uh, to programs from by vulnerable populations. And we identified the need for um, the government to really understand the barriers um, that certain populations face, whether they be remote, whether they be indigenous. Um, th there, there are so many different barriers that need to be addressed. And that's very different, I think, from procurement. So if I would split the two, um, I, I would say that there, there are different recommendations and different approaches that are needed when it comes to ensuring that Canadians can access benefits that the federal government is providing and that there needs to be more done there to identify who isn't accessing them and then how to remove those barriers. When it comes to contracting, however, there's a different, a different set of rules, and I do think it still comes down to access, however. You don't want to make it so complicated that smaller um, vendors may not be able to participate in federal government procurement um, because everyone can, can add to the public service and, and make it better. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. 
Beginning our second round, Ms. Block, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us here today. Of course, we've had the opportunity to um, hear from the Auditor General on a number of occasions, which I think is um, quite right to, to be having you appear before a number of committees, given the seriousness of your last uh, report tabled in the House of Commons. But my questions, I believe I'm going to uh, aim at uh, the Treasury Board Secretariat or the Treasury Board. So given what we have learned over the past 18 months, and certainly more recently through the Procurement Ombudsman's report, the Auditor General's report, and actually testimony from witnesses, there appears to be a lack of oversight across government departments. One of the main reasons for this, as we heard yesterday, is due to the lack of enforcement of the Financial Administration Act across departments. So my question for you, Mr. Hupe, or whoever would like to answer, is your department responsible for ensuring the compliance of other departments with this act, or is it up to departments to police themselves? So that's a very good question, Mr. Chair. I, I would say dual accountability, okay? As I explained, um, Departments operate within a set of, of authorities that have been delegated to them. So the expectation is that when they do operate within these authorities, that they have uh, the measures in place to ensure compliancy to the different rules and legislation, um, and they have to abide by the Financial Administration Act. Um, at Treasury Board, when the delegations, when there's a transaction or project, for example, that's above uh, the departmental delegation, uh, they need to go through, um, you know, Treasury Board ministers for the uh, for the authorities to, for example, enter into a contract for the authorities to launch a project that's not within their set of accountability. So there is some oversight there. Uh, and there are general oversight. Uh, I own, you know, for example, the um, the internal audit community, uh, and I have a role to play in delivering every year some horizontal audits across government. So we're trying to line up our work between, you know, what Auditor General is doing, what the other bodies are doing to make sure we don't duplicate. So yeah, there are measures being taken uh, to ensure compliancy, uh, but again, non-compliancy will sadly be found in some of these reviews. Thank you very much. Um, your website states, and I quote, the Secretariat ensures tax dollars are spent wisely and effectively for Canadians and that you oversee and provide guidance to the Treasury Board of Ministers, as you've just noticed, on how government is managed and how it regulates. Since your department is responsible for the oversight of spending taxpayers' dollars and ensuring that they are spent wisely, and given that the issue of Arrive Can has been in the news for the last 18 months, who in your department is being held accountable for the failures of the Arrive Can app? Right now, what we're trying to, first of all, you know, we've, uh, we take the findings extremely seriously. So as Treasury Board, we are looking, all of us there, there's notions that came out that deal with you know, financial records not being in place, procurement practices. There's also a notion of conflict of interest. There's also a notion of, you know, augmentation from an IT perspective. So it plays on, on many of the different roles that, that, we, uh, that we oversee at Treasury Board. And right now, as I said, we are taking this very seriously and putting an action plan together to ensure that our role will be played in this particular situation. But I would go above and beyond that. I'm looking personally uh, beyond a rife can't, right? My worry is that the system of controls need to be there everywhere. And like I said, we have a solid financial community. We have a solid, I would say, procurement community. Sadly, uh, we see uh, stuff like that happening. Uh, and we, but we still need to make sure that, uh, so I've, I've instructed, as an example, the <coughs> chief audit executives of every department about a week and a half ago to make really, really sure that they had a review of their procurement practices in the coming year, uh, you know, as an audit within their, their, their department. So there are things that we're doing to make sure that our account, 
accountability is discharged. So really quickly, do you think your department did its job during the pandemic to ensure value for money for Canadians? Honestly, from what I've seen, and I'll speak for myself, I'd like to think that, uh, yes, again, there was no playbook with the pandemic. Uh, you know, it was a, a first time. I think that genuinely there was a, a lot of people, uh, you know, wanted to ensure that the right decisions were being made. Again, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to waste time and explain it again, but we did take the time to make sure that departments understood what it meant to operate, you know, outside the normal control framework of the government, if that was the case, need for documentation, need for audits to be done. Uh, so I think we did uh, provide direction. Uh, could you always be better? Perhaps, but we did we did take our role very seriously during the pandemic. Thank you very much. Sviva, uh, Ms. Shanahan joining us virtually. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and I too want to thank uh, the Auditor General uh, and uh, the team uh, from the Treasury Board for being here today because, uh, and I think by the tenor of the questions that we're hearing, <clears throat> uh, uh, all members in this committee have concerns uh, regarding uh, oversight and um, why and, and why not it did not work in this case. And um, something that came up in the testimony yesterday uh, from uh, Monsieur Richard was that people um, were uh, reluctant and, in fact, refused to um, professionals, uh, uh, financial, um, uh, financially accredited uh, employees of the public service, uh, were afraid to do what essentially is their job, and that is to to raise uh, red flags uh, where warranted. Uh, Monsieur P, um, if someone has something to say about any financial practice, um, what are the ways that that employee can say it safely within uh, our public service? So. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm extremely concerned uh, by the, the comments of uh, Mr. Richard yesterday, and, and I'm not disputing them, uh, to be fair. Uh, I've operated for over 30 years uh, in the financial community of Government of Canada, and I can assure you that when I had something to say, regardless of my level, junior officer, I said it. Um, so. Mr. Uh, Richard yesterday said it, I think, um, very correctly in the sense that you should be talking to your supervisor. And if you feel that your supervisor is not reacting, um, you know, there are ways that you could go uh, above your supervisor, so the next level up, if there's something that you feel very, very strongly about. And like I said, my, my experience is that, you know, at least in the organizations that I ran, uh, the door was always open. And I think that was made very clear that people could actually speak up. So I'm going to have a chat, I guarantee you that, with Mr. Richards, uh, because if there is, uh, you know, some people that we have an issue, we need to figure out what we're going to do uh, with it. And we need to f make sure that the community understands and the people operating in these communities. And, and we're talking about the financial, he was talking about financial management community, but I'm, I'm extrapolating that to the procurement communities and so on. People that are experts in their field have to have the space uh, to raise their hand if they have to, something to say. Well, uh, thank you uh, for that, because uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it's not just about a rive can. Uh, if, if this is uh, uh, symptomatic of uh, a wider problem, we need to uh, identify it and uh, remedy it. Uh, and indeed, uh, on a separate note, and uh, and I see we do have someone, uh, Monsieur uh, Franco, um, uh, who is the executive director for procurement uh, in uh, TBS. When the procurement ombuds uh, testified before us, uh, he said that he found it curious, and I certainly want to explore that, that in the um, uh, competitive bidding process um, uh, where the uh, the bid was rigged uh, so that GC Strategies could win that bid. There were other, there were uh, eight or ten other companies that uh, could have lodged a complaint uh, about that bidding process. Uh, can, can I hear your comments on that? Thank you for the they question. Did not, they did not lodge a, a complaint, and you would think they would have had a financial interest in doing so. Uh, thank you for the question. So first, uh, regarding why the other companies may not have lodged a complaint, I, I can't speak on their behalf. But what I can say is what a normal process would look like. First of all, that it's not 